it is virtually impossible today for the practicing physician to not be exposed to the technology of radiology. From CT scanning, MRI scanning, ultrasonography, and fluoroscopy, among other techniques, the physician will be required to use a plethora of tools to image their patients and study normal and abnormal anatomy, otherwise known as pathology. Welcome to this presentation on an introduction to radiographic anatomical techniques. In this short insight lecture, you'll be exposed to a multitude of technologies used in imaging the human body, allowing us to solve more complex disease puzzles than ever before. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Oh, and on one other note, get used to looking under the paperclip icon of these Adobe Presenter presentations. It's there that you'll find the PowerPoint, document files, and other PDF files that contain important information. The PowerPoint for this presentation can be found there too. Download it from there and follow along if you'd like. And if you're using a Mac, make sure that you have the most recent version of Adobe Reader on your computers. You'll need it to play these presentations. Chapter 1 of the required textbook, Sectional Anatomy for Imaging Professionals, is where you should start reading for this presentation. No, we won't be interpreting cross-sections of a human anatomy just yet. We need to get familiar with the language of radiology and the orientation of the human body first. When I say required reading, I mean it. You must read your textbooks and use the PowerPoints as the adjunct to your learning, not the other way around. A PowerPoint is the teacher's tool. The textbook is your tool. Combining the two will make you a better student and a smarter doctor. Start medical school off right and don't just use the PowerPoints. That's a huge mistake. While it's important to get into the habit of reviewing the lecture objectives from each presentation, don't get addicted to them. Learning objectives, as we use them in the anatomy department, will help you focus your knowledge on those structures which we expect you to know. But they are no means inclusive. They are by no means the end all of your anatomy education. In this presentation, you should learn to recognize some common forms of radiographs used in the diagnosis and management of human disease. You should begin to assimilate cross-sectional anatomy as a tool in understanding human form and function. You should also begin to ascertain what type of radiographic modality is used to create a particular image on your patient. And equally important is learning the history of radiology. We do this by teaching you some of the basic physics involved and in turn asking you to memorize some of the important names in radiology, such as Tesla, Hounsfield, and Rentgen. For example, in your examination of a patient who will require an MRI, the strength of an MRI is measured in Teslas. The magnet strength and the ability to increase that strength will improve resolution and determine whether, for example, your patient can have a breast MRI performed. Hounsfield units, named after the inventor of the CT scanner, help the radiologist determine whether a structure is solid, blood, pus, fluid, etc. These names are not superfluous to your education. Know them and learn them now. Here's a basic summary of radiographic techniques you'll be exposed to as a physician. Simple x-rays, called plain x-rays, i.e. like a chest x-ray or an abdominal film, to look at a fracture or to look at an underlying anatomy without using a more complicated tomogram, serves as the basis for most radiology. We'll learn later what a tomogram is. If you've ever seen an old Bugs Bunny cartoon, you'll know what fluoroscopy is. Fluoroscopy is a technique that allows the radiologist to visualize the moving body. Just like when the Tasmanian Devil, in the Bugs Bunny cartoons, walks behind an x-ray screen and you can see all of his bones as he dances around. Examples of fluoroscopic examinations include imaging of the bile ducts, called a cholangiogram, or looking inside a woman's uterus and fallopian tubes to diagnose causes of infertility. This is called a hysterosalpingogram. Tomograms are generated in a special way. You're probably most familiar with the tomogram as how a CT scan or a CAT scan is created. 
Tomography is a method in which an object is imaged by using radiographs focused in a single horizontal geometric plane. The images are then reconstructed using computers so that any plane can be viewed in any direction. The most common plane used is a transverse plane, but the computer can reconstruct the images into a sagittal, coronal, or oblique plane, and sometimes into any geometric plane. Already, you're learning to use the language of anatomy. As the patient lies in the CAT scanner, the x-ray source rapidly revolves around him or her, taking thousands of images in a few seconds. The computer then reconstructs these tiny pixelated images into a picture, which you see as the cross-section. Positron emission tomography is a specialized method of imaging. It combines a PET scan, i.e. an image used based on radioactive glucose technology, and merges these somewhat fuzzy images into a CT scan high resolution image to create a single image called a PET fusion CT scan. We'll show you some examples later and this will make more sense as you progress in these insight lectures. Ultrasonography can be used intraoperatively, internally or externally to create a cross-sectional image of the human body. Ultrasonography is usually the easiest and least expensive and often one of the best methods to image the body. Ultrasound is an imaging technique not based on radiation, but based on sound waves. Other techniques such as a gamma knife, mammography, even thermography as well, or other techniques using radioactive chemicals such as technesium can help generate images of the body to aid in the diagnosis of various diseases or conditions often requiring interventional or surgical treatments. Examples of imaging modalities using radioactive technesium include examples such as a HIDA scan, an imaging technique used to image the gallbladder, a Meckel scan which is used to look for a Meckel's diverticulum, you'll learn about that in embryology, a bleeding scan to look for occult gastrointestinal bleeding, a bone scan to look and see whether a cancer has spread to the bones, and a cardiac scan, an imaging study used to assess the functioning of the heart. Angiography, both traditional and computer enhanced, represent ways in which the blood vessels of the body can be imaged. Fluoroscopy is often involved in obtaining these images. Contrast studies, such as an upper GI series, allows us to look at our swallowing mechanisms and the anatomy of the oral cavity, the pharynx, the esophagus, and the stomach. Barium enema examinations are still used today to look at the lower intestine and even the upper intestines. Barium sulfate is allowed to flow from the anus and rectal area into the colon using fluoroscopy to get an image of the entire colon. Bronchograms can be used to assess and analyze and review the anatomy of the respiratory system, but thankfully they've been relegated to history. The patient used to have to inhale barium sulfate to get a picture of the bronchial tree. Google it and get some bizarre images. Bronchography has been replaced with endoscopic visualization of the airways using a tiny endoscope. This imaging technique is called bronchoscopy. It's not a radiographic examination, however. Some radiographic techniques, such as lymphangiography or lymphocentigraphy, allows the radiologist or surgeon to look at the lymphatic system. It's used today in breast cancer imaging, a technique called sentinel node biopsy. And thank God, an outdated test called pneumoencephalography, a barbaric technique to look inside the brain and the ventricles, to look for brain tumors or blockages of the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid out of the brain, causing a condition called water of the brain or hydrocephalus, is no longer used. Even in the virtual anatomy lab, you'll see some techniques of recreating 3D imagery of the human body. Night vision goggles will not use per se in the diagnosis of human disease, do demonstrate another technique that can be used in imaging in darkness. If you don't know what any of these modalities are, Google them. Use the internet. Use all the materials at your fingertips to increase the flow of information to your brain while you're in medical school. The sky is the limit in medical knowledge. Just for fun, I put a link here to a YouTube video from a game show called Let's Make a Deal. Take a look and you'll better understand why it's so important to use radiological imaging in the evaluation of your patient. Imagine, after watching this video, if each of the contestants in this game show had x-ray vision like Superman and they were able to see behind each of the curtains. But imagine how boring the game would be. 
In medicine, we don't have time to get bored. We have to know what is behind the curtain if we're going to treat our patient properly. I've also placed some images of a pneumoencephalogram, a barium enema, and a bronchogram, which we referenced in the previous slide. Imaging in medicine today is akin to opening up a birthday present. You never quite know what you're going to get when you've opened the present. It's no different when we image our patients who have disease. We use radiology, blood tests, microbiological findings, and of course our physical exam skills, as well as a host of other technologies to help us treat our patients and come to a proper diagnosis. If you think of every patient as a package full of surprises, then you get the idea of what it's like to practice medicine today. Imagine trying to treat your patients as they did a hundred years ago without any imaging modalities. Then you'll be able to understand why some of the crazy things you'll learn, like agophony and pectoriloquy, were used. We'll talk about those in another Insight Lecture. During your physical examination course called Medical Skills, you'll learn a variety of techniques to assess the package without using radiology or sound waves. For example, we often listen to the package using our stethoscopes or we tap on it, called percussing. We feel it, called palpation. Or we look at it, called inspection. We might even shake it. We're trying to figure out what's inside the package without opening it. And in this case, that means without removing the skin and looking inside. That would be a little traumatic and barbaric. Some of you might actually be old enough to remember comic books advertising various gag gifts like these x-ray glasses. Every kid under the age of eight years old wanted a pair until you actually got them and saw that they were just pieces of plastic frame with cardboard inserted for lenses with holes punched in them. Of course, it also came along with a lot of fake claims and that's how they managed to sell them. We don't have anything quite like the real version of x-ray glasses, but Google Glass and some other technologies will soon be used in the examination room. They will allow us to record and broadcast a physical exam for distance learning, teaching, and consultations maybe even for medical legal purposes. We'll be able to access our patient's medical records, bringing them up instantly, and view them without a bulky computer monitor. Here's a short video clip demonstrating how Clark Kent, otherwise known as Superman, could use his x-ray vision. Go ahead and click on it, and it takes about a minute and 52 seconds. We can't do this yet as physicians, but in the future, we might be able to use Google Glass type device to do just that. Just a note, PowerPoint doesn't play very well with video clips, so I would suggest that you take the PowerPoint presentation out of presentation view and click on the video separately. It may perform a little better on your PC or your Mac. I put some of these goofy images in to show you how far we've come in imaging the body using radiographic techniques. To image the body has always been one of the most useful purposes of x-rays, but as technology gets better, sometimes imaging modalities don't even need to use x-rays. An example is an MRI scanner. The MRI scanner actually uses magnetism to image the body. Let's take a look at how we can use our hands and our eyes and our ears and the tips of our fingers to try to assess what's inside the package before we take the patient to the radiology suite. We can listen to the package. We call it auscultation. By using a stethoscope, we can learn a lot about the diagnosis of the patient. The stethoscope is used to listen to heartbeats. It's used to listen for heart murmurs. It's used to listen to bowel sounds or the flow of blood through the various vessels in the body. For example, when we listen to the carotid arteries, if an abnormal sound called a brewery is heard in a blood vessel, it may indicate an impending blockage and that may require surgical intervention. What is a microphone but a listening device? That in turn rebroadcast at a higher volume, i.e. amplification. Yes? Do you agree? Isn't a microphone akin to a unamplified stethoscope? 
we can actually tap a package, just like playing the drums. We can tap the abdomen. We can tap the lungs. And based on what we hear, we make a clinical decision if further studies are necessary. I put a video clip in here of a seven-year-old drummer pounding out Tom Sawyer by Rush's Neil Peart. I put this video in here not because you're going to play the patient's abdomen like a set of bongos, but the technology is basically the same. We're tapping the abdomen and we're listening for the sounds. The character of those sounds determines what's in the package. We tap the lungs and we listen to the characteristic sounds. It tells us if there's fluid in the lungs or if we need to perform further studies. Interestingly, the former drummer of KISS, Eric Carr, shot in the video Forever, is seen here after he was undergoing chemotherapy for a very rare pericardial tumor. The pericardium is a sac around the heart. It's exceedingly rare to have a cancer of this layer around the heart. His hair is a large wig and Paul Stanley, the lead vocalist, has to auscultate his music through his left ear. Paul Stanley was born with only one ear, a rare condition called microtia. Pericardial tumors, microtia, drums, auscultation, kiss, rush, rock and roll, all in a lecture about radiology and physical diagnosis. Today we image the body in a variety of ways and many of those methods provides us with cross-sections. A CT scan, an MR scan, and even, if you think about it, a microscope slide of a tumor used in the histology lab. Looking at it under the microscope is another method of using cross-sectional anatomy. Cross-sectional anatomy requires an ability to see past the normal 3D depths that you would see by examining your patient or your cadaver with your eyes or your hands. Cross-sectional anatomy requires an in-depth understanding of the underlying gross anatomy and the ability to flip these images in your head from the 3D cadaver image or from the examination of your body so that you can view the cross-sections just like a slice of bread or slicing cheese or a slice of butter takes a little time to get used to. I placed a link to the Visible Human Project. This project originated at the University of Colorado by Dr. Vic Spitzer and resulted in a computer program which we use called the VH Dissector. VH stands for the Virtual Human. We will use this program in the Virtual Anatomy Lab and by the end of this year you'll be able to read a normal CAT scan as well as a normal human MRI scan and even a normal ultrasound of the liver, thyroid, kidneys, and maybe even breast. You might be able to read a normal mammogram. No other medical school in America exposes their students to the amount of cross-sectional anatomy you get at ATSU. Of course, what if you're percussing the anatomical or human package, looking at it, inspecting it, and feeling it, palpating it, isn't even enough. Today's technology allows us to actually look into the orifices of the human body from the ear canal to the esophagus and stomach to the colon via colonoscopy. Even small tiny cameras allow us to look inside the Montgomery glands of a woman's breast around the nipple to look for breast cancer. It's truly remarkable. Again, I have linked some videos here to reinforce the idea of looking into the human body using endoscopy. The link is an optical entry into the abdomen showing me in the operating room gaining access to the abdominal cavity using laparoscopy. In addition, I have put a video link here to a cystoscopy looking into a patient's bladder and a video showing you a normal colonoscopy looking into a patient's colon, i.e. the large intestine, to give you an idea of the technology that we have in diagnosing our patients. The technology sometimes can be overwhelming. Again, these video clips are put here to help clear up issues that might be vague to you as a beginning medical student. I strongly suggest that you watch them in their entirety. It'll make you a lot smarter, better, and able to understand things as we move forward in your curriculum. Of course, if we've listened to the package and felt the package and palpated it, even shaken the package and we still don't know what's in it, finally, now we can x-ray it. There, this is no different than the technology that's used in an airport when you're scanned for explosive devices. 
Of course, the speed, the type of radiation, the length of the radiation exposure, and the detail obtained is different, but the idea is the same. The physical examination of our package, i.e. the package of the human body, begins with inspection, looking at it. We have to look at the patient and form a clinical judgment. Do they look sick? Are they faking it? Are they malingering? Are they near death? Are they in pain? Are they happy but complaining that they're in pain? All of these interrogatories allow us to better explain and better assess what's going on with our human package. Truly, the hospital can be a theater of pain. We listen to the package with our stethoscopes. We listen to the patient's lungs. We listen for breath sounds to see if they're equal or if we can hear fluid in the lungs. You'll learn in your physical diagnosis course that various lung sounds lead to various diagnoses. For example, if you've ever taken bubble wrap and squeezed it, the sound that results mimics the sound of a patient suffering from pneumonia or sometimes fluid overload as a result of a failing heart. We can learn a lot just from listening to the package using our stethoscopes. If we can hear blood rushing through the vessels and creating an abnormal sound called a brewery, as we mentioned before, it can be a sign of an impending blockage of a vessel, perhaps even causing a stroke. We learn to see the blood vessels by listening to them. We can also listen with ultrasound or Doppler scanning. We'll learn about these in one of our next Insight Lectures. In our next presentation, we'll learn even more about the physical examination. It's the physical examination which, which should be performed first on any patient before we use radiographs to assess within the human package. But now, let's talk about some review questions. Number one, what is a brewery? Number two, what's auscultation? What's palpation? Number three, what's fluoroscopy and what's an angiogram? What's a bronchogram? What's a pneumoencephalogram? And number four, what's a hysterosalpingogram? Number five, explain tomography and give an example of a tomogram. Number six, give examples of cross-sectional anatomy and the modalities that provide them. And finally, number seven, give an example of two imaging modalities that don't use radiation. I'll answer this one for you. MRI scanning uses the proton spin of the water molecule and magnetism to create an image. And of course, ultrasonography uses sound waves. While they're not radioactive imagery techniques, they are imaging modalities used in the imaging of the human body. We'll see you in just a minute in the next Insight Lecture. I hope you've enjoyed it.